Hi everyone. We've already seen how in Colossians, Paul speaks warmly of Epaphras, presenting him as a great example to follow. He speaks of him as a, a dear fellow servant, a, a faithful minister of Christ, a preacher of the gospel, a founder of a church, a, a prayer wrestler, a, a hard worker for God's kingdom, a visionary prepared to go to new places to further the spread of the gospel. And it's good to take time to think about some of the, the challenges his example raises for us, about being changed to be more like Jesus, about wrestling in prayer, about being prepared to engage in the new things God is calling us to do. But in Paul's letter to Philemon, we find out something more about this man. We find this in, in verse 23 of that, that short single chapter book, where Paul says this, Epaphras my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus sends you greetings. He's no longer just a fellow servant of Christ, but now he's a fellow prisoner in Christ. And to understand what's going on, we need to step back a bit. There are great debates over when these two letters were written and where they were written from, uh, Colossians and, and Philemon, that we're thinking about this weekend. They're both referred to as prison letters, meaning that they were written by Paul when he was in prison. We see references to this, uh, for example, in the fourth chapter of Colossians, in verse 3. Pray for us too that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. And then in verse 10, my fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings. So he has another fellow prisoner. And it makes this clear right at the beginning of Philemon, in verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. Now, for those not familiar with the story behind the letter to Philemon, it's mainly about one of his slaves, someone called Onesimus, who'd end up spending some time with Paul. And again, there are questions about how that came about. But Paul is now sending him back and encouraging Philemon to receive him as a Christian brother. And in uh, Colossians 4, 7 to 9, if we look at that, we find that uh, that letter is being brought by a person called Tychicus in the company of Onesimus. He was actually identified as someone coming from Colossae. And with Philemon living in Colossae and Epaphras having planted the church there, it may even be the case that Epaphras had introduced Philemon to Jesus. Lots of interaction and relationships going on that we, we know a little about, but not too much. So with all of this going on, it seems highly likely that both letters were sent at the same time, carried by the same people, so written at roughly the same time. So that's what I'm going to assume, and also to assume that they were written when Paul was in prison in Rome. We find that experience described in Acts 28 verse 16 onwards. We find from the account in Rome that Paul was not actually in a Roman prison although he had spent quite a bit of time in there previously. But he'd rented a house and lived there for two years, chained to an armed guard. So not a great situation, but much better than being in prison. And it enabled him to welcome people into his home and to proclaim the kingdom of God and to teach about Jesus. We see this in uh, Acts 28, 30 and 31. And somehow we see in Philemon 23 that Epaphras had become his fellow prisoner. What does this actually mean, do you think? And what had changed between the writing of Colossians and the writing of Philemon? As we saw earlier in Colossians, Paul refers to someone called Aristarchus as his fellow prisoner. And as we saw earlier, simply refers to Epaphras as a fellow servant, with the implication that, that he was out and about and doing great things for the kingdom of God. But now in Philemon, it's Epaphras who's referred to as this fellow prisoner, while Aristarchus, in verse 24, is now referred to as a fellow worker. This might suggest that there was at least a small gap between the writing of the two letters, even if they were actually delivered at the same time. And it's as though these two people, Aristarchus and Epaphras, had swapped roles. But the bigger question is what is meant by being a fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. 
I'm aware of three different suggestions. And whichever you, you, you think is best, or if you have an alternative, whichever of these, they raise different challenges for us to think about. One of the simplest ideas is that both Aristarchus and Epaphras had done time with Paul, but not necessarily on this occasion. We don't know how many times Paul was actually imprisoned, but writing to the church at Corinth, he does speak about being in, in prison frequently. We find this in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23. And Paul might have been looking back on some of those occasions, maybe prompted by this experience of being in chains again, and remembering the times he'd shared together with these good friends, shared together in prison, imprisoned, restrained, restricted, but united in love and friendship and for the gospel. And sometimes when we're going through times of difficulty, particularly if it's a recurring problem, it can be such a blessing to remember those who have experienced it with us in the past and to remind, be reminded of what a comfort that was to have people with us in those times of difficulty. Let's take the opportunities we have to come alongside those who are struggling or in difficulty and seek to be a comfort and a blessing to them. It will help at the time. and may even continue to be a blessing in the future when we can't be there with them as they look back on those times shared with us. Who can we bless in that way this week? Another idea to explain this uh, concept of being a prisoner uh, of Christ Jesus is that Paul is using the word metaphorically to communicate something spiritually significant about Epaphras and the choices he's made, the work he's involved in. Paul often uses military imagery to communicate ideas and he, he speaks about being in a spiritual battle. In Ephesians 6, 12, we find this. Paul writes, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And if this is what Paul means here, then he's recognising that Epaphras has, has recognised that this is what's going on that he's understood the spiritual battle that God's people are called to engage in, and he's been prepared to sign up, to put on the armour that God provides, that, that Paul was just going on to describe in, in the next few verses in Ephesians 6, and that Epaphras is prepared to stand and to fight in the power that God gives against the dark spiritual forces that are at work in this world and acting against the people of God. And if this is the case, then it gives us a deeper insight into his prayer wrestling that we were thinking about earlier as he spends time with God. He was, again to quote Paul, praying in the spirit on all occasions as part of the spiritual battle he had entered into. Are we engaged in this battle? Are we using the armour God provides? Are we active in prayer to push back the forces of evil? Are there others who look at us and see fellow prisoners in the battle, those who are prepared to stand with them against all that is wrong, to stand with them in the power and the name of Jesus? If this is what Paul meant by being a prisoner of Christ Jesus, then what a great title for Epaphras, for anyone to be known by. A third idea, and I will admit, this is the one I hope Paul had in mind. I don't know, but I hope is that Epaphras, as well as Aristarchus on a separate occasion, had been prepared to voluntarily come alongside the imprisoned Paul and join him in his restrictions. That he had been prepared and willing to go to Paul to spend time with him, to help him through this difficult time of imprisonment, maybe even to accept some restrictions on his own freedom and liberty, so that he could be a support and a blessing to Paul as he experienced this forced uh, restriction on his life. Maybe this explains why on one occasion Aristarchus is described as the prisoner while Epaphras is another time in Philemon. They'd taken in turns to do this out of their love for Paul and their desire to give him as much support as they could. They could not free Paul, they could not even take his place, but they could be alongside him to encourage and to support. Sometimes when we see someone struggling, 
particularly someone who's important to us, someone we care deeply about, we might want to take their suffering from them and take it on ourselves. When I injured my leg on a mission trip in Thailand, the trip leader felt responsible and said to me he wished it had happened to him instead. When a parent sees a child injured, they might wish that the injury had happened to them instead. But we can't do that. Each of us needs to endure the difficulties we find ourselves in, but we can be there for each other to offer all the support and help we can. As in the words of Paul, we seek to bear each other's burdens. Is there someone we know who is burdened? Someone who may be unable to leave their house, just as Paul was at this time. Someone who's going through real difficulties and suffering. In most situations, we can't take that burden away, but we can offer to walk that difficult path with them and be there in their difficulty and struggle, just as Epaphras may have chosen to do for Paul. Are we prepared to be those people, recognising the impact it will have on our own plans and lives? This is all the Bible says about Epaphras. We know little more of his life. Early Christian tradition says that he became the first bishop of Colossae and that he was martyred for his faith. All of that, if it actually happened, as tradition says, he stood with Paul, he continued to stand with Paul as a fellow servant, a fellow prisoner of Christ. Someone who was a blessing and encouragement to Paul. Someone who contributed significantly to the spread of the gospel in those early days. How are we going to respond to his example? How will people describe us because of the choices we make, because of the things that are important to us, because of the things that we engage in? We see so little written about this person, but what it says speaks so powerfully about his heart for God, his commitment to Jesus, his infilling of the Spirit, his passion in prayer, his, his focus on the gospel and the kingdom of God, his willingness to come alongside Paul in those times of difficulty and be to him all that he could. Let's seek in the power of the Spirit to live in a similar way and be a blessing to others today.